born and raised in Galena, Alaska. And went to, uh, through grade school in Galena and then two years, freshman and junior, and then went the correspondence course and then went to Mount Edgecombe down to Sitka for two years. While I was there, me and a couple of other guys who signed up for joined the army as soon as we got out of the high school that fall. So, so on September 67, I was in the army. Spent basic training in Fort Lewis, Washington. Halloween night that year, I was crawling around under barbed wire in a rainstorm, sloppy mud. Near shooting tracer shells over the top of us. Finished that, then went to Fort Eustis, Virginia for AIT, advanced training. Become a helicopter engine mechanic. After we got done there, they fill out a dream sheet. They asked us, you know, where would you like to be stationed, you know? Everybody said, oh yeah, I'm going to Germany, you know, I'm going to Hawaii. I told them, no, I wrote Vietnam, you know, and they all thought I was nuts. Come to find out, none of them went to Germany, none of them went to Hawaii. I ran into a few of them in Vietnam and, hey, Harris, what's the matter? You didn't like Germany? <laughs> oh, F you, you know. <laughs> so. I knew where I was going right from the beginning, you know, so no use to pretend. When I left Galena, it was, it was like been 40 below. So I had long jaws and a big heavy coat and all kind of stuff. And got down to San Francisco and getting ready to go to Vietnam. And it couldn't change, you know. And everybody's looking at me kind of funny, you know. I got on the plane, there's almost over there, you know, it's getting really warm. You know? <laughs> Got off the plane, a hundred and some, you know, and I still had a long johns, you know. <laughs> Everybody thought I was crazy. I thought, well, shit, it was kind of chilly when I left home, you know. <laughs> they said, where the heck are you from? I told Alaska. They, what, Alaska, you know. Back then, you know, Alaska was some far away, frozen planet, you know. When I first got off, I had to get on a bus. And the first thing I noticed is bullet holes all over the side of the bus and no windows. But that big mesh screen, a heavy screen. I asked that guy, what happened to this? He said, oh no, he just got shot at. He said, happens all the time. He said, this is Vietnam. I said, What's all this screen on it? Where's the glass? He said, no, nah, they, they throw hand grenades through them pretty easy. They, say, well, they, they can't throw hand grenades through the glass or that mesh, you know. So, oh. so, and you start looking around. And I, I see a F 105 strafing over here, you know, dropping napalm. And what's that guy practicing? <laughs> no, that ain't practicing. I told him, enemy is that close? He said, enemy is all around us. <laughs> So it took a while to sink in, you know, so it, it was actually real, you know. It wasn't bad over there, I wasn't in no combat or nothing, so. Worked on a lot of chopper engines and saw a lot of, you know, goofy stuff happening. They were Slinging them in with Chinooks and dropping them off not too far from our, our shop where we worked. So we'd always go over there and take parts, you know. Like, like uh, the army is kind of crazy. We were not allowed to stock like hydraulic hoses and stuff, you know. So we'd go over to the boneyard, you know, and find a good hose, what we needed. And we'd, bring it back, you know, and use it. And 
perfectly good stuff. And like on a turbine engine, you, you need a quarter inch 12 point saw, uh, box end wrench because there's 72 nuts and bolts around a combustor housing. And that's the only wrench you can take them off with. But we were not allowed to have one. The army did not issue that. You had to go down to Saigon to the black market, you can buy a wrench. And the same way with wire twisters, they will not issue you when you had to go buy them on the black market. That's US Army brains, you know. When a guy first gets over there, he usually gets the kind of the shitty details. And one of them was the new guys get to carry that big heavy M60 and the M79 grenade launcher. I didn't know that, you know, and I said, oh boy, get to carry this big machine gun, you know. And it's, so I got stuck with it every time we got rocket attack and we had to go out to the bunkers. That's when one of the guys that was in the bunker he was there for, and he asked me if I knew how to shoot the machine gun, M60. I told him, no, no. Well, how about that M79 grenade launcher? No, look at me. Said, how about your M16? I told him, no. He said, boy, talk about a green grunt. He said, and that's what you are from now on, green grunt. And call you Gigi. I started laughing. And the other guys they caught on to it, you know, and that's what they started calling me. Next thing I know, even a commanding officer, and that's all they knew me by was Gigi. Let's see, at night, when I'm out in guard duty on top of the bunkers, you know, watch all the action going on around us. And it was interesting, you know. And then when they start blowing up bombs kind of closely, you know, you start thinking, hey, this is, this is serious, you know. <laughs> they actually mean business, you know. And like one time we were sitting out there on top of the bunkers watching them at night, and this little ways from us, we see this helicopter going by with all his lights on, you know, big floodlight and lights flashing. I told this other guy that was with us, he's been there a while. Oh, gee, that guy is crazy. He's just asking for trouble. He told me, just watch behind him. He said, look really good close behind him in the dark, you know. And I look, and I all of a sudden I could make out another gunship behind him. That guy ahead was just being a decoy. And then the guy behind him, as soon as he sees fire, you know, he'd, he'd start shoot. I told him, I don't think I want that job. <laughs> they were so far on the perimeter, there was uh, watchtowers. They were 60 feet high, and the poles were just straight up. You climb up a ladder to get up in there. And then I was in tower number four all by myself all day. Yeah, kind of bored up there. <clears throat> and I happened to look down, I, I could see these little frogs down, way down there, bouncing around. So, hey, they look like good targets. So I got the M16 and I start shooting at them. All of a sudden, the OG, the officer, the guard, come over the radio. Tower number four, what are you shooting at? I said, oh, uh, I, I thought I saw some movement over there in the jungle. I, good eye, troop, good eye. Keep it up, keep it up. Uh, yes, sir. <laughs> Continue shooting frogs. I had permission. <laughs> I never did tell them otherwise. <laughs> Worked on the Hueys. All the different models of Hueys. That, the ugly earlier ones here, nobody wanted to work on. And then worked on the Cobras, and <clears throat> worked on the Cayuse, the little egg-shaped choppers, and worked on the Chinooks. 
It's a complicated process. And you set a transmission and a chopper. Is there too many fast spinning parts in there? So it's got to be, you know, just exact and the manual, you know, will tell you all the measurements to take and all this. And, but they never did, you know, understand the book or nothing. And like an idiot, I did, and, and, and they found out I did. So every time they put a transmission in, they come get me to finish it. And so I ended up working in day shift for an engine shop, and a lot of nights I spent working on a, installing transmissions, you know. They wouldn't let me go on R&R &R when everybody else went. They said I was needed at the shop there. So then one day they got a call that <clears throat> over in the coast, a place called Vung Tau, which is actually an R&R &R center. They had a twin turbo Mohawk airplane with one bomb engine. So they wanted me and another guy to go over there and fix it. So we caught a ride on a chopper and we flew over there. We swapped the engine out in like two or three hours, you know, and we were done. But we didn't tell nobody, you know, so we just stayed there and we started going down to the beach every day, you know. <laughs> just kind of hanging out and trying to hit all the bars, you know. And we were looking at that one street, long street, and there's just bar after bar after bar. And my buddy, he says, I know what we'll do. We'll check out the girls in the bars, you know. We'll just have one beer at each bar and then go to the next one. He said, and we'll check them all out. I told him, yeah. Do you realize that's over 200 beers? <laughs> oh, yeah, that ain't going to work. <laughs> I shot that idea down. <laughs> it was on guard duty at night, you know, and it was during a Tet Offensive, of course, and I had an open Jeep, you know, and he was the OG, the officer of the guard, you know, and he wanted me to drive. I told him, I never been down that, that area before, and it's pitch dark, you know. So I tried to turn on the little running lights. That's what they're made for. And he's, no, 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 turn the lights on. I kept telling him, I can't see nothing. That's OK, just keep going, you know. So I'm going along, and all of a sudden, the Jeep just tipped over like that. <laughs> he fell out of the passenger seat, and he's gone. And I managed to climb out and get back on the bank. And he's down in the hole hollering. <laughs> We got to some other company and they heard they were digging a big cesspool. <laughs> he fell out of the jeep and he fell in there. Some other guys come running over and they had to pull him out of there. I thought, I told you I can't see you. <laughs> After I said, go ahead, turn your lights on. <laughs> you know, our, our base was on the perimeter and it was about 200 yards before the jungle, and um, there's a, a minefield that the French put mines in back in the 50s, and there's no markers, and you just had to watch where you walk, you know. But every night there during a Tet Offensive, uh, but somebody over there would fire one round, one shot, you know, at the base, nine o'clock every night. So you just got to where you just duck down, you know, at nine o'clock, and sure, so a bullet would come flying through the wall somewhere, you know. It's kind of a nuisance, you know. Then Fourth uh, of July come around. By then, everybody was tired of it. So nine o'clock come around, and all of a sudden, everybody opened up with. M60s, you know, M79s, M16s, plastered that whole area across the way there. And the sergeants and stuff, they're all pissed off, you know. They were telling you not to shoot, not to shoot, no, no celebrating. We weren't celebrating, you know. We were trying to get that guy, you know. So next night, everybody's all tense, waiting, waiting, ducking down, you know. At nine o'clock, you know. And 
Hei, lasă ne Da, cum se ia One time, you know, toward the evening, and we'd go out in that minefield and we'd set up claymore mines, you know, and uh, trip flares. So you light up the area so you could shoot. It. But then, you, like I said, you got to be real careful where you step, you know. And this one new guy, dipshit, was out there and he put up too many flares. Then he forgot where the wires were for them, so he's trying to come back and he tripped them. He let off a whole bunch of his own flares and it caught all the grass on fire. Then we had a great big fire out there burning, you know, and they were trying to squirt it with a little fire truck, you know, but it, it wouldn't reach. So they got a helicopter and they pick up the end of the hose and they were flying over it and trying to put fire on it. We told them, let it burn, it's getting rid of the grass, you know, so the enemy can't sneak up in there no more, you know. And they finally put fire out, and a few days later they lit it on fire and said, hey, that is a good idea, let's burn it, you know. So, and should have left it alone in the first place. <laughs> oh, yeah, the one guy is, I don't know, I think he was so scared that he might get injured or <laughs> killed or something. He wanted out of Vietnam so bad. So one day he went out in the perimeter in the minefield there and he found one of those French mines that were set. And, and he stuck his foot out there and blew half of his foot off. So he got his wish. He went back stateside. Well, I never did uh, find out a, <laughs> a good reason for us to be there in the first place. I'm still trying to find out, but and um, my opinion you know, is f French, Americans, everybody should have just stayed out of there. But that, uh, we did what we were told to do. You had to do, you know, but you didn't necessarily believe in it, you know. But. And then toward the uh, end of my tour, you know, last few months, it even got worse, you know, and the locals were cussing at us, you know, and spitting at us and hollering, and Yankee go home, you know. Same thing when I got off in San Francisco and went in a terminal, you know. There's hundreds of people in there, you know, and they're hollering baby killers, you know, and giving us the fingers and calling us names. And That's why I was glad to get out of there and I finally landed back in Galena. First thing I did was I threw all my ribbons away and paperwork, you know, and accomplishments, my uniform, and I, I burned everything up, you know, I just, I didn't even want nobody to know it, you know, it's just nothing. And everybody was in the bar. Hi, hey, Wayne, how you doing? You know, they didn't, like, they didn't even know I was gone, you know. <laughs>